Jesus.
go back to where I played some golf in the second panel. Okay? So I turned around and said, first panel is the most policy uh, witnesses sworn in. So they can consider the evidence. Prior to that, they can't consider the evidence. And so I saw all my square and I saw that the only thing that came out of that was the record. The record that showed the kidneys and the fact that I got high. Before uh, we get into our testimony, if I could, I'd just like to briefly introduce this witness. His name is Tommy Nieves. He serves as general counsel of the Project Oca- Oversight Watchdog Group of Scottish Health Screening and Tracking. Tommy Larkin is the Senior Vice President of Council of Professional Services Council with the Planning Commission of the Lax Bank of Tracking's in the United States. Uh, my entire statements are uh, on the record, part of the record, but I don't have the material to what we just summarized, and so it's kind of sitting here for the first panel. I have uh, Blake's uh, requirement uh, familiar with the outline of what I'm going to present on this. I'm going to start with the Internet Party Act, and then I'm going to go ahead and move on to the system of the Internet Party Act. I don't want to do this by hand. I'm going to kind of jump in here. I'm going to test the waters a little bit as far as the federal contract and the bill. And then start with the Internet Party Act, and then we'll talk about the oversight. And I'm going to just acknowledge the fact that Back in 1981, as the Internet Party spoke to its origin, the word was Internet Party. Back in 1981, when the Internet Party founded, the Internet Party was this idea that still exists today that people can make requests of any person or external entity that is the holder of a credit debit card or debit card issue as of 2007. Second, there was no such thing as a paper internet application that actually had a signature. But there was no actual person or entity that wrote the recommendations made by the Internet Party Acquisition Advisory Committee as well as the Republican Committee in general of the Republican Party, in general of the Republican Party Board, and in Party of Alex Trump in Maine. Uh, Republican was the largest supporter of the bill, but it didn't become part of the contract party, and everybody was expected to follow the contract in 2007. However, the second bill, the Internet Party Bill, was what I made today. I testified before the Internet Party Committee in support of the HR 4045 program. That bill was written by Bill O'Reilly. Since this idea was kicking around last year, there were a number of people that decided to bring this bill to my possession. This is something that I thought that was going to come out of this contract as the overarching consensus of this contract and what it's come out of. And the Internet Party is by far the better contract. But I believe that four hundred and ten instances of this contract being adopted by the committee is not good. Uh, the Bannon case is an evaluation as to whether something good is going to be implemented or not if you look at this bill. Um, HR 3045 provides protection for free and emphatic internet contract use by state government officials. While Congress has considered this level of legislation in the past in several instances, the bill was not successfully passed through the committee nor has there been any other bill passed setting an issue this past year as important to bill. Specifically, the Telecommunication Contracting Offices has made violations of federal credit reporting law with regard to its contracts and its debit card network. The bill will not create a process to give us a credit report without the bank knowing of any requirement that would result in the suspension of any account. I will readily disagree with HR 3045, which talked about codifying the law and the actions and agencies are already taking on the bill. More importantly, however, in this instance, it is neither the law nor the evaluation made by HR 3045 are authorized or official, and the bill will proceed without these other aspects of this decision not shared with any agency. Now, the Gaming International Gaming Electronic Task Force Legislation Committee uh, has proposed a similar database that would uh, report uh, violations of federal law in this bill. This is an affirmative authority for the task in Congress and the agencies to give away. The sharing of information between the Congress and the agency would be proposed and now result in the FOIA authority being reported to the contract agency. I will again say that I don't think that the key on this is contract, especially if it is going to be funded. This kind of stuff is contract law by the public. I believe that the biggest big criticism about what the federal law does when it comes to scale back the type of information that is included in the Internet Party Act and the FOIA Act is more concerned with collecting the number of calls that the administrator settles and the number of calls without any information being put in line with the record for the transcript. More importantly, is that the contract was passed in front of the Internet Party in 2007. HR 4085 is also very important. Uh, we actually think it should be part of the contract law as it relates to the Internet Party. But I don't think 
I think it doesn't have to necessarily be what the specification is saying. It can turn the issue on the right of way or the scope of the right of way back to Secretary of State himself. And then the question of whether the state has done something that would fall under the Secretary's right of way. And just to bring it back to the example of what would be the issue, if the EPA is saying that the right of way is beyond the consent, and that's certainly the government's position on the consent question, it doesn't matter whether it's the point, the six, the 26, or the 106, the government has personally done the contract, and in that personal contract with the contract with the other party, the right to challenge it. Is that the EPA's position that the issue is not before us? Well, it's the point that the case here is that the compensation applies to cost of operation, not to the right of way. And I think if we have a sense of what the percentage of right now is of the right of way now, then the question I think is whether the right of way is beyond that right now. Well, the question is just whether it is beyond that right now. And I think the sense made by testimony where the official or officials of the government decide that it is not just beyond that right now, it's 200% beyond the right now, but also there's not some exception. And that is also what Verizon is saying. And Verizon's position seems to be that there's no fixed price contract, no percent of the fixed price contract that is beyond the right of way. So it's one of the right of way. Oh, sorry, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, he's concerned with the fact that the part he was talking about was that compensation that the homeowner would get that the right of way provision would have applied but for the fact that the right of way was beyond the right of way. That's right, Your Honor. The right of way applies to just the overall scope of the agreement. So it's very specific price for the right of way. It's not that the right of way would apply to the cost of operation. Well, but the right of way is beyond the right of way. That's your point. That's correct, Your Honor. And the right of way is dependent upon the right of way. That balance is being struck. The right of way is very clear. It says $20 billion salary is the percentage of the percentage of funding. And the point of that is that the Treasury Reg does not impose a right of way requirement on how to do that. It is simply the price that the government has to pay to act as a funding source. And so somehow that has to track the right of way. And I think the point that the brief seems to be making, and I think the case law is properly making, that if the Treasury Reg determines that a thousand dollars a year is the right of way, well, then it's not beyond the right of way. It's actually beyond the right of way. Well, it's beyond the right of way. It's actually the compensation of right of way. It's also beyond the right of way. So the right of way has to be by percentage of what the government is giving up in terms of how the right of way has to be by percentage of what the government is giving up. Well, it's beyond the right of way. Well, well, it is beyond the right of way. It is beyond the right of way. Obviously, contractors sign their claims in every form of capacity trying to claim right of way. But if they post adequate information in front of the next big entity that exposes the issue at issue when it comes to the fact that it's the point of the contract and not just any piece of the agreement, it's checking the application. So I don't think the court is really in any distress on that point. But overall, the practical thing I want to argue is that the way the claim is being asserted is that the rate, that the claim is clarity, and the contract price does not equal something that the former contractor would have to pay to settle the claim. And there's a lot of components that are being required here. And on the fixed price, the proposal here is that Verizon wanted to have a fixed rate proposal that compelled the entire cost of the contract. So when the government has an added fare and fixed rate right for the goods and services that the contractor would have already been priced in front of the rate that the government is giving them, their right to demand that fixed rate, then it's within that agreement to challenge what the added fare is by going to the contractor and saying, repriced at fixed price by the government. Is there any other questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you
Ich bin ein Mensch, der sich gerne Zeit für andere Menschen nimmt. 